Okay. So now we're going to get into um, the different biomes. And you learned about biomes probably in like fourth grade. And it was like the tropical rainforest and the desert and that type of stuff. And so if you look at this map here, this is just showing you aquatic biomes. And so that's what we're going to start off with. So all of these things that are highlighted in the different colors are going to be aquatic, which is going to be they're somewhat water related. Um, so if we go to your notes, you can see here that there's a couple of different types. So the first type is going to be a lake. And in order for something to be a lake, it needs to be a standing body of water that, um, here's a good picture of it. And so I'm going to make that bigger. Awesome. And so um, you can see that it's a standing body of water and there's not going to be any sort of current going through it. Now the next one is going to be, oh, that's a wetland. Are we already on wetlands? Wow. All right. So this is a wetland that you see right here. And what a wetland is, is it's going to be an area that's inundated with water at least some of the time. That means it can dry out. And wetlands are going to be super important, like seriously important. And that's because they act as um, stopover places for migrating birds and that type of thing. So they're really, really, really important as far as wildlife goes. Very diverse communities. Um, the other thing is, as far as our uh, benefit that we get from them, is they are a natural filter for water and they're great for drainage. So they actually help to drain rainwater and so that's why they fill up when it rains and then they kind of dry up as it gets a little drier. Now, a lot of coastal areas have wetlands and one of the reasons they think there's such bad flooding when we have hurricanes and stuff like that is because a lot of people have filled in wetlands, um, which is not a good idea. In fact, if you get caught filling in a wetland now, you're paying a lot, like 10,000s to hundreds of thousands of dollars in tax or um, fines because that's illegal. Um, I used to have a job as an environmental consultant, and one of my jobs was to actually map out um, wetlands for people like, let's say it was like the Department of Transportation and they wanted to extend a road, sometimes if they want to widen a road, it's going to impact a wetland. So I would actually have to map out exactly how much they would imp impact the wetland, and then they would have to create a new wetland somewhere else to deal with that. So there are ways that you can actually um, deal with that issue. Okay, so wetlands, extremely, extremely important. Um, the next one is going to be streams and rivers, and I think that's pretty self-explanatory, right? So they're going to have some sort of movement, some sort of current, and um, going from one place to another, and they're going to have plants and animals in them. So here is a picture, I believe, of the Mississippi. Oh, sorry, that's a wetland uh, restoration. Um, here's a Mississippi right here, so you can take a look at that. Now this next one, really, really important, very productive ecosystem is going to be an estuary. So if you look out here on the horizon, that's actually the ocean. And then these are rivers that are meeting the ocean. So you've got salt water mixing with fresh water. Very important ecosystem because um, when you have that salt water mixing with fresh water, it's called brackish water. And the whole thing is just a more mild um, environment for fish to start their lives in. So estuaries are like a little nursing ground for all the things that start their lives in the ocean. Well, not all, but a lot of them, um, especially shellfish and things like that. So they're usually going to have mangrove trees, and these are the mangrove roots that you can see here. And so they have a lot of places to hide so they can stay protected. One of the coolest snorkeling trips I ever took was actually through an estuary and when the tide was going out so you can just kind of put your hands in front of you and Superman through it and it was amazing because it was like miniature aquarium fish everywhere it was so little mini sharks little mini barracuda super super cool so this is a really important um, ecosystem because once again it helps with flooding and that type of thing especially when we have hurricanes um, next one is going to be coral reefs, which I'm sure you're familiar with, and coral reefs are going to be pretty diverse as well. Look at all the fish and all the corals and sponges and all the things living on them. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about them later. Um, and then the last one that we're also going to get into later is going to be what are called the intertidal, pelagic, and benthic zones. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Sorry. 
Okay, so those are the aquatic biomes. The next one is going to be terrestrial biomes. So um, when we say a biome, that's going to be a bunch of communities of organisms living in one area, and they're going to be having a similar climate. So usually temperature and precipitation are going to be the big things that are going to tell you what type of biome you're looking at. The other things that can come into play is going to be whether they have good soil structure, or whether it's sandy, or whether it's rocky. Um, and also whether they have a constant climate or the climate changes seasonally. So the first one, and I should mention, all of these um, amounts of rain that I have listed here, you don't have to actually know, like, 200 centimeters. Um, you just want to know if that's a lot or a little rain. You don't have to freak out with numbers like that. So I'll tell you right now, two to 400 centimeters of rain a year, that's a lot. Um, so obviously the tropical rainforest is going to get a lot of rain. It actually gets the most rain out of all the ones we're going to talk about. Um, tropical rainforest, you've heard about a lot. Um, this is actually a map of all of those. Um, so here you can see a tropical rainforest, very, very lush vegetation, lots and lots of plants and animals. I don't know why that keeps doing that. Um, lots and lots of plants and animals. Um, and you can see that they lie along the equator and then to each of the tropics. So that's where the whole tropical rainforest comes from. Another important part about them is you can see these clouds here. And what they do is they actually have a lot of um, transpiration, which is going to be evaporation coming off of the leaves of the plants and then raining back down. So they have their own little microclimates that they create. Now the next one is going to be a savanna. So this is a picture from Kenya. Once again, you can see that we're still between the tropics, um, but it looks a lot drier, right? And that's because a savanna is actually one step above a desert as far as dryness goes. So it's going to have a rainy season and a dry season, but a really, really big dry season. And so what's going to happen is you're going to have plants and animals being active as far as like mating and that type of thing only during the rainy season. And that makes sense because they want to make sure that their offspring are okay. All right, next one is going to be a desert. Here we go. Um, so if you look at the plants that you see in the desert, much smaller, right? All these other ones had big trees and that type of thing, and these guys are very, very small and compact. And that's for water conservation, right? Because the desert gets less than 30 centimeters of rain, very, very, very dry. Um, when would you think that most things would be active that live in the desert? Hopefully you're thinking nocturnally, and that's because they need to conserve their um, water, and so they're going to lose less water to the environment at night. Now that being said, big temperature fluctuations in the desert, right? So it can be really hot, over 100 degrees during the day, and then at night it can get to freezing. And that's because there's not a lot of water in the air to help stabilize the temperature. So that's going to be our deserts. Next one is going to be a temperate grassland. Um, now, one thing I want you to notice in the deserts is that you can see that they're, you know, kind of spread out in um, different places, but still pretty close to within the tropics. Now, if we go to the temperate grasslands, you can see if the tropics line is here and here, you can see that they're just above and below the tropics now. So um, temperate grassland is going to have very deep, fertile soils, perennial grasses. Perennial means that they come back every year. Um, and if you think about it, look at where we have temperate grasslands in the U.S., right in the middle, in the Midwest, right? Well, what is the big um, industry in the middle of the, the country is farming, right? And that makes sense if there's fertile soils and that type of thing. So that's going to be our temperate grassland. Wow, my computer's telling me all sorts of fun stuff. All right, now let's find where we are in the notes. Okay, we're here at the temperate broadleaf forests. So temperate broadleaf forests, they're going to be hardwood forests, and you can tell from this picture that they are what are called deciduous. Deciduous means that they're going to lose their leaves in the fall. Now the reason that they lose their leaves is so that they don't lose a lot of water to the environment during the winter and also to reduce the weight of snow. If you think about the times here in Colorado where we've gotten an early snow before the leaves have fallen off, what happens? All those branches break and we've got people's cars getting crushed, right? And that's because those leaves are holding on to more snow than if the leaves weren't there. So that's too much weight. All right. Uh, next one is going to be our coniferous forest. 
So you can see that this is definitely something we have here in Colorado. Um, Colorado is kind of an interesting state because we have desert, we've got coniferous forest, we have some broadleaf. So it's a really interesting place with all our elevation changes. Um, but anyway, coniferous forest, you can see we're getting a lot further north now. Um, and so it's going to have a pretty dry climate and um, the trees are going to have the needles that they keep all year long because those needles aren't going to lose as much um, to the environment. All right. Next one is a chaparral, and here's a chaparral right here. So um, Northern California is going to have this, South Africa, all of those countries around the Mediterranean are going to have this. And so once again, don't, you don't see like huge plants here. You see an occasional tree here and there. But um, this is going to be more of what's called like a scrub ecosystem. So you're going to have a lot of dry weather, and the plants here are going to be adapted to fire. So what I mean by that is a lot of them have cones and things that won't open until they're exposed to fire. And then there's also some that have what's called a clonal root system, where if this is a tree right here, it'll send out a clone a couple hundred feet away and grow another clone right here so that if this one gets wiped out by fire, it still has its gene pool over here. Kind of cool. All right. Oh, uh, sorry. Um, now we're going to get into the taiga and the tundra. So let me, whoops, sorry. Ah, there we go. All right, so the taiga is that picture that I just had up here. Um, and you can see a little tougher to live in, right? I don't have a map for this one, but um, it's going to have kind of marshy, boggy areas, not a ton of diversity. So it's getting to be pretty harsh. And then, of course, what's even more harsh of an environment is going to be the tundra. And so here's a map you could see where you find the tundra that's like northern Siberia and Alaska and that type of thing. Not a lot of vegetation, very, very tough to live. Another thing that you're going to have is what's called permafrost, and that's going to be where the first three feet are going, uh, of soil are going to be permanently frozen. Okay, so those are going to be the biomes. Uh, aquatic and on land. In this next part, we're going to get into aquatic ecosystems and how the currents and all of that affect our weather and that type of thing.